let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the uh, crap show that is our uh, response to uh, uh, the pandemic. There's a pandemic, Michael. I'm not once sure. Once in a hundred year pandemic, Sam. What's that? Like a once in a hundred year pandemic. Well, like let's hope so. Yeah, let me be, yeah, right, exactly. Fair <laughs> at enough. At least uh, once in the trailing hundred years, um, there is reason to believe, you know, and, and when I spoke to uh, a uh, one of the early interviews we did with an epidemiologist, I asked him, what's your uh, biggest fear? And I said, after this, and he says, um, COVID 2022, uh, because he's like, you know, the, the, the reason why people have been predicting this um, particularly over the last 20 years has been the change in the climate and the human expansion into areas uh, into every corner of the planet. And so, you know, I think it was SARS uh, or MERS. That was a function of a kid who was playing in her backyard. Uh, I think it was a, a, a little girl or a little boy playing in their backyard. And um, you know, the development had been so much that it had taken, you know, more uh, out of the, the jungle and they were exposed to a virus from some bats. I think it was that had never been there before, but uh, you know, yeah. the other day, a virus uh, that pigs now apparently have people, there's some scientists who are afraid it made make the jump. I mean, who knows, but uh, hopefully knock on wood, it's a once in every hundred years. Here is uh, Anthony Fauci. Uh, this guy who is obviously deep state, trying to undermine uh, Donald Trump. CIA, uh, Fauci. CIA, uh, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, deep state, Barack Obama, deep state. Uh, it's all people who wear masks. Addressing the Senate Committee on Health and Education, Labor, and Pensions that had a hearing um, in the wake of, you know, the, uh, the, the surge that we're seeing. And we're still in wave one, folks. It's just that it's, we got a big country, so that wave just takes a while before it hits uh, the other shore. I am also quite concerned about what we are seeing evolve right now in several of the states. As you know, in four of the states, in Florida, Texas, California, and Arizona, more than 50% of the new infections are in those areas where we're seeing surgeons. The things we need to do, I think you alluded to in your question to me, We've got to make sure that when states start to try and open again, they need to follow the guidelines that have been very carefully laid out with regard to checkpoints. What we've seen in several states are different iterations of that, perhaps maybe in some going too quickly and skipping over some of the checkpoints. But even in states in which the leadership in the form of the governors and the mayors did it right with the right recommendations. What we saw visually in clips and in photographs of individuals in the community doing an all or none phenomenon, which is dangerous. And by all or none, I mean either be locked down or open up in a way where you see people at bars, not wearing masks, not avoiding crowds, not paying attention to physical distancing. I think we need to emphasize the responsibility that we have both as individuals and as part of a societal effort to end the epidemic, that we all have to play a part in that. And I think if you look at the visuals, what we saw were a lot of people who maybe felt that because they think they are invulnerable, and we know many young people are not because they're getting serious disease, that therefore they're getting infected has nothing at all to do with anyone else, when in fact it does. Because if a person gets infected, they may not be symptomatic, but they could pass it to someone else, who passes it to someone else, who then makes someone's grandmother, grandfather, sick uncle, or a leukemic child on chemotherapy get sick and die. We've got to get that message out that we are all in this together. We are now... Four months in to this pandemic in the United States, four months of when basically the first like lockdowns happened. The idea that 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 concept is not out at this point leads me to believe that it's not going to get out 
through the means that Fauci is looking for. Like at one point, Fauci has to make a decision. Is his, and I, you know, I, I feel for the guy, um, is his presence in this administration actually achieving what he hoped it would? And would he achieve that goal? Could he promote that goal more by leaving at this point? I mean, he's up there saying this, and it's not like, you know, there's no federal leadership here. There is, there is any, anything it's to the contrary. And so, you know, how, you know, do you make a, a I, I just wonder if Fauci at this point, because the federal uh, response has been so anemic and irrelevant, if he couldn't do better by, you know, two weeks in the news of going basically rogue and saying, I'm quitting because the administration is simply not taking this seriously. There's no point in me being here. I'm better off as a private citizen. He'll get like a week's worth of, uh, of media to go out and be much more explicit. But now he's got to be sort of like, you know, uh, you know, diplomatic about it. And, you know, well, there, you know, none of these states opened up applying the 14 uh, benchmarks that the CDC recommended. Uh, New York, at the very least, has decided that phase f of three or four is not going to include uh, indoor seating at restaurants. I mean, right. <clears throat> thank goodness for small favors. But the bottom line is like, we don't have a, a, the capacity as a society, as a as a comprehensive society now, to um, really make you know priorities. You know what should be the priority? I mean, you know, from my perspective, as a as a as a father of a small kid, I, I want schools to be to be uh, open, like you know, and. and there, the economic activity, that's just not sustainable this way. The government needs to obviously give money to people to stay at home. They need to do all the things in terms of alleviating rent and whatnot. But in terms of opening up, like where do you spend? In New York, for instance, we have, we have created essentially a certain amount of slack in the system. There's a certain amount of leeway. Where do we spend that leeway? Like where, you know, what's, who are, you know, is it, People going to, you know, indoor restaurants or to bars, or is it going to be sending kids to school? Like, that's basically the choice that we're at now. And Fauci's got to come out and be more explicit. And he, I think he's just, you know, he's being too diplomatic because he obviously he's got a problem within the administration. And yeah, I mean, no he has a completely thankless task. I, I, I don't I mean, I, I wonder, I think from a media perspective, it would be more effective, maybe if he quit, although, frankly, whatever, even, you know, I mean, look, he's already demonized by right wing media anyways, it wouldn't make difference one way or another. But if he left, yeah, I think from a media perspective, but I wonder, I mean, I would like to know more about his role, because I do wonder if there's still some aspect of bureaucratic power where he's cushioning some things on the back end, which I have no idea. I wonder, right. I wonder I too. I really, I have no clue. I mean, I, I wonder what his calculus is. I'm not, I'm not interested in, you know, romantic, you know, the guy's not perfect like anybody else, but he seems pretty sincere and diligent in his work. And so I'm kind of willing to maybe give him the benefit of the doubt as to why there's a reason he hasn't quit yet, because it's very obvious that I mean, he's not, not only he's not being listened to, he's a target yeah. of media and he's also you know, regularly undermined by other forces in the administration. I real quick. I mean, well, we can't well, even wait, handle. Wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. On that point, all right. So you've made the argument that maybe Fauci has some administrative value that he is aware of that the, we're not aware of, which we wouldn't be. And, wouldn't and be, he sees it as yeah. he makes an assessment as to whether he uh, should resign from the administration. Because at one point he's got to. It seems to me like it's just like his efficacy. You know, he's not going to hang on until the next one. And so, you know, at one point, it's like, how much can he impact how this is going? And so far, it hasn't been great. Now, maybe he's thinking in his head, well, if Texas and Arizona and uh, parts of California and Florida in particular, if they go, uh, if they get so bad that maybe they will start to listen. Um, my response to him, uh, if that's what his thinking is, would be, let me introduce you to a Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, whose state is, um, you know, the, the number of new infections in that state is breaking a record practically every single day. 
Here is Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick uh, on the Laura Ingram program. Reality is a, a lot different. We've had 2,200 and rather 2,424 people die, and New York has had over 31,000. Even California has had almost three times as much as Texas. And remember, Laura, those two states have been locked down the whole time while we have been open. So locking down doesn't work. If it did, those two states would be doing better than Texas. Fauci said today that he's concerned about states like Texas that skipped over certain things. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We haven't skipped over anything. The only thing I'm skipping over is listening to him. You know, you have a lot of doctors on your show from day one. Your doctors have been right almost every time, and he has been wrong every time on every issue. I don't need his advice anymore. We'll listen to a lot of science. We'll listen to a lot of doctors. And Governor Abbott, myself, and other state leaders will make the decision. No thank you, Dr. Fauci. I mean, I mean, they, number they one, Texas is, Texas running, is they're running against him like they're, they're, they're running they're against him. him as a political uh, weapon. And Texas is skyrocketing and also just, you know, whatever, track this disconnect as you watch these people. That one part of the message is this isn't I mean, whatever, we've already gone over this, but this isn't a big deal. We're going to listen to the science and we're not going to be hysterical. And then on the other hand. This is the guy, and he was just a couple of weeks too early. We were still actually shocked by this as a society. We still thought hitting 100,000 deaths was completely unacceptable. So he got ahead of himself. He should have waited three or four weeks. But this is the same guy who, in the first couple of weeks of this, gave the most nakedly social Darwin position I've ever seen publicly expressed by an elected official. And this is in Trump's America. This guy said on Fox News, grandparents should be ready to kill themselves so people can get out to work. So I look, I actually take very, yeah, I think he's been completely consistent in not listening to public health advice from the beginning. I just don't think it's science that's driving it. Right. And let's remember, not to mention the, ethics. For years, it was the death panels of the of Obamacare, which was the animating um, issue for the right wing in this country, which was the idea that we would uh, in some way uh, there would be an assessment as to effective cost effective uh, mechanisms um, that would you know, would be that based upon cost efficiency, these panels would refuse to pay for certain procedures for people that would cause them to die. And meanwhile, and, and it's like granny's going to be at a death panel. And in fact, um, the Patrick is, is like one man, a death panel. One man, death, one man, death demands. And, and also, I always want to note this too. New York, Columbia University uh, put out a study that said that the lockdown had begun a week earlier I think it was upwards of 30,000 people might not have yeah. died. Yeah. And that is primarily people dying in New York in the beginning. Yeah. So New York, not only was it not some liberal overreach, if you look at the release of people to nursing homes, the delay of the lockdown, yeah, New York was insanely reckless and disgusting. And de Blasio and Cuomo bear a responsibility for that as well. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. The Cuomo in particular gets Cuomo, no credit right. for moving people into... Uh, nursing homes. And the reason why they had to do that was because of all the budget cuts. Yep. And, and I'm not convinced that he didn't do it. And I think we'll get more of the real story about this, you know, over the years, but uh, uh, over the months, maybe years that follow, but I'm not convinced that he didn't do that as a way of hiding the deficit of public hospital beds so that he could move forward with the cutting of Medicaid that was teed up at that time. I, I'm quite convinced that the cutting of Medicaid drove a lot of the decisions that were there to hide the deficit of beds that we had for public hospitals in totally. this state. Really disgusting. 